It's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, sad to see the show end. This is the last day of this wonderful show. Um, sad to see it end. Uh, you know, being immersed in Modukwela's work for the last five days or so has been amazing. Um, the feedback has been wonderful. We've had lots of different types of people come into the space to enjoy her work. Thank you, Modukwela, for choosing us. It's been a great pleasure to have you here. I hope this is the beginning of many more collaborations like this. Um, and I wish you success in Senegal and in all your very big, wonderful plans. Uh, congratulations again. Of course, it gives me great pleasure to introduce these two wonderful women who I adore. Um, Lola Ogunaike is a blessing to us all. Um, a wonderful breath of fresh air. Um, and um, I am so happy for her interest in us um, as a continent, us as women, and in telling our stories in a way that nobody else has ever done. Um, um, she has a following and a platform that will really um, sort of um, push us out there in the right way. So thank you, Lola, for taking interest in what we do and telling our stories in a kind, wonderful, um, and excellent way. What, <laughs> thank you. What can I say about this very talented young lady? Um, I wish you more success. Um, I am blown away by your talent. And this is just the beginning of what will be many, many years of delighting us um, and expressing yourself. So welcome, everybody. I hope you enjoy this talk. It's great to have you here. Thank you. You ready? I'm ready. I know you are. Welcome back, Madupe. Thank you. This is your first exhibition in three years, and it's been a whirlwind week for you. How are you feeling? Exhausted? Elated? A bit of both? I'm feeling relieved. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling rested. I was exhausted, but I'm feeling rested for this morning, for this talk. Um, I always look forward to talking about the narratives behind my work. So I've been reserving my energy for us. <laughs> Ooh, thank you. All right. So you all but disappeared from the scene. You were gone for three years. You even deleted your Instagram account. Who does that? I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Why were you motivated to go underground? So I had a pretty big exhibition three years ago, Dreams from the Deep End with Gallery 1957 in Accra. And it was bigger than we imagined. We created a documentary. That documentary ended up touring. We went to New York. We were at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, it, the narrative and the exhibition really extended beyond the walls and the timeline of the two-month exhibition in Accra. And while it was exhausting, I, I liked that template. I liked the template that we used for the exhibition. And I thought if I was going to do that again, I would give myself more time. Um, I was also thinking about the sustainability of my career, uh, where I wanted to practice, where I wanted to set up my studio in Philadelphia versus Ibadan, and what all the variables were, like considering that and just really sitting through and understanding also the management side of my practice, not just the painting side. Uh, and it turns out it took three years. I, I hadn't intended for it to take three years. I thought it might take two years, but um, it took three years and deleting my Instagram uh, that was inspired I think in part by a book I read called Deep Work uh, anyone know this Deep Work by yeah you know it this is not a real one is one of my closest friends she recommends almost all the books that I read um, but in that text it's by Cal Newport he talks about and I was saying this the other day to a bunch of students that came um, from a university to visit they were asking for advice on you know, how can they uh, deepen their interests? How can they kind of do what I do? And I said, honestly, cut yourself off from social media for six months, just as an experiment. <laughs> and like, don't cheat, don't check. You won't miss anything unless you're already making money on Instagram, just leave it. Um, but his argument is that in, this, in these times, the people that can do that are gonna do 10 times better than anyone else because nobody's willing to do it. Yeah, so. That was that, and then I came back and, uh, yeah, ready to st for this, yeah. 
How did you know that this was the right time to reemerge? Because you could have easily pulled an Adele or Sade and been gone for six or 10 years. How did you know that you were ready to return to the scene right now? And she is back on Instagram, by the way. So she's really back. <laughs> well, those are big names to uh, you know put in the same sentence. But uh, I was still going to wait until next year. This exhibition was going to be in Senegal. Um, and then I called Mrs. Falawio, talked to her about the idea. Um, and everything like happened really quickly. I also spoke with uh, Tokini Peter's side and we thought it would be a good idea to introduce the concepts. I mean, this is an introduction. It's a, it's a very extravagant introduction, um, but it's an introduction to a traveling series. And I thought better to just bite the bullet. There are gonna be mistakes made. Um, I have nerves, but I've been sitting on this body of work for three years and I thought it was just time to let go. I wanna talk about the exhibit traveling, but I wanna also first talk about the title of the exhibit, mm. The Artist's Algorithm, Why Nations Win. That's definitely provocative. Break down what it means exactly and what made you wanna explore this topic? Um, so th the whole series is called The Artist's Algorithm. Uh, and this uh, introduction is called Why Nations Win, largely because I think that's the central and defining question for all the exhibitions that you'll see, whether we're in Senegal or whether we're in Harlem. Um, and it's a question that I've always thought about as a child, having um, been born in Togo, but grew up partly in the States, partly in the UK. I lived in Rwanda, lived in Tanzania, um, and then moved to Nigeria actually as an adult. And you know, even as a child, you're looking around and you're saying, why, why is this country doing well? And this one is you know, just sort of in a continuous failed state or lagging behind. Um, and those questions have stuck with me from when I was studying you know, sort of engineering, economics, and education, and even now as an artist. And so I think it's the central question um, for all of my work and really maybe all of my life's work as well. Um, and the artist's algorithm is an attempt to answer that from an artist's perspective, right? And so, art, so nations win because they celebrate their heroes. They celebrate um, people who have contributed to uh, society in creative ways. We have Mama Nika, an icon here, Mrs. Folawio. We have Dr. Stella Adadevo, um, who effectively sacrificed her life seven years ago and averted a global pandemic, um, in my opinion. Um, and she's from Nigeria. So these are people that we need to celebrate. And the more you celebrate, the more there is to celebrate. So that's a way that nations win. And this exhibition is my attempt at doing that from an artist's perspective. Um, is that why this work figures so prominently in the exhibit? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a work that I did four years ago, and I decided I wasn't going to sell it. I want it to travel. I want the world to know about Dr. Stella Dadevo. Um, as of the time she passed, and even when I did this painting, you know, we we might have we might have had an, a smaller understanding of her significance. But in light of a global pandemic, we should really be revisiting this and understanding. Not what she did, not only what she did for Nigeria, but what she did for the world. I mean, imagine if Ebola would have spread to the world, what that would have done for the already tarnished reputation for Africa, right? This disease going to the world and ravaging millions or hundreds of millions as the case would have been with a more deadly disease like Ebola. Um, so I just think of the counterfactual situation and that image, that purpose, that sacrifice is something that I want to, to show to the world. And this is from your uh, coin series as well. Can you speak to me about um, the role that having someone like her on a coin, what role that you, what role you wanted that to play in the conversation? Yeah, sure. So this is from the Heads or Tails series that I started also t seven years ago. And the idea was that I was challenging the hierarchies between men and women um, and the fact that we primarily only see uh, figures of men on monetary objects. And so one has to ask, what does that, how does that play into how women feel about their value and worth when all the, the notes just convey uh, men and leaves out 50% of you know, the population that's contributing to society. Yeah. So that was that uh, series. I burned the paper to show the ever declining value of the Naira and many of our currencies in, in Africa. What are we at now, dollar to, to I heard, yeah, I heard 500 yeah, to one. Five, five, 570. Girl, where you been at? <laughs> oh, where you been at? 575, right? And um, 
Well, yeah. Let's not talk about yeah, that. Yeah, anyway, yeah, moving, uh, forward, moving yeah. right along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that you have plans to take this exhibit on the road, but why was it important for you to start in Nigeria? That was really important. I mean, I think I wanted to start in Africa so that it would be a pan-African discussion. Um, but I know with the last, ex oh, the last exhibition I did from Dreams from the Deep End in Accra, uh, you know, I know there was a lot of FOMO from people at home. Like, Why didn't you bring this exhibition home? Why didn't you bring this exhibition home? And it was, it was loud and clear. And um, I, I decided that I would start here. I know it's going to go far and beyond. And I wanted Nigeria. I wanted this caliber of an exhibition to be held in Nigeria. Um, so that was significant to me. And the game as well. I knew I wanted to include the game. This game I created in 2014 for the National Art Competition. Uh, it describes the Nigerian education system and all of its dramas. Uh, and then it won a prize in Dakar. This is the thing about work also sort of traveling. You need to be mindful of the audience. Um, and in Dakar, people could relate with the struggles of youth unemployment. And then it traveled to Paris. And while it was a beautiful exhibition, Ellen Atsui was in the exhibition, like I was so honored. I was not feeling the interactions from the French people really? that were playing the game. Not them, they didn't do anything wrong. It was just like, I felt like we were airing our dirty laundry, right? Mm. French people are not gonna come and do an exhibition and talk about all their challenges in Nigeria. They'll give us the best. They'll talk about their food, their culture. And so if we're talking about our problems, I'd rather us talk about them at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to bring it back. Keep it within the family, within the, family. the proverbial family. That's right. Um, before we dive into more specific works, can we talk about your overall creative approach to this exhibition? How did your process evolve over your three-year sabbatical? It wasn't quite a sabbatical because you were working I the was, entire time. I was working. Yes, you were working. <laughs> but during your three years away from, yeah. from us. Yeah, so I think within the first year, and I have my studio manager here, Shino, who's been with me for four or five years, had a whole family within the, <laughs> you know, what you call last studio. But we, we first started doing um, experiment. We started doing a bunch of experiments. So we were experimenting with beads, different materials, and I had time then. Um, and it was, I don't know, it was difficult to train everybody to switch from we're producing for an exhibition to we're just experimenting for the fun of experimenting, right? Because we're spending money, wasting a lot of money, like making a lot of mistakes. We would use the wrong glue. I would travel to, to the US, work with the Smithsonian only to find out that like, you're not supposed to be using that glue. They would tell me that they have works in their archives um, that haven't done well because some artists didn't use the right materials. They're not saying it's wrong, by the way. They just are you know, sort of telling me from a preservation and conservation point of view to, to be mindful, right, of the material selection. I visited Mama Nike in the studio a few times to show me some of her beaded works and what she's done in the past. I have some video of her telling me how to mix one epoxy resin. I mean, I learned a lot. It was, we documented everything. These works will never see the light of day, um, but they've led to the one, the singular beaded work in the back. <laughs> uh, so there was a lot of experimentation just to get to one work um, and then yeah, should I go? I mean, I can go on for forever. <laughs> Please keep going on because I know that you did a significant amount of research mm -hmm. around just finding the right canvas. Right. And I don't think people understand just how much you poured into that entire process. Can you walk us through step by step? Um, one, how you went about finding the perfect canvases sure. for this exhibition and why it was extremely important for you to get it just right. right. Yeah, sure. So. Typically, that, that is a work on paper, on burned paper. It is archival quality paper. And I've done, my last exhibitions were on burned paper. Um, and traveling with paper before it's framed uh, just produces some anxiety for me. So I wanted to translate the work into canvas. Um, and it turns out that you can't just pick up a canvas and burn it. It doesn't burn the same. It doesn't give you the same effect on paper. And so. I went to an art school in New York and picked up like six different classes and was experimenting in each one um, different canvases and would buy from this art store, write down the reference number of the canvas, try it out, uh, write down the results. It was like a lab experiment. So I have like a book of all these experiments and how each of the burning works for each canvas. And then we arrived at something that's like beautiful and actually just not that expensive, um, easy to fold. Like, 
it's sort of like the logistics of art that nobody actually thinks of in terms of even traveling with your art as you become an international artist. And so again, back to the idea of the artist's algorithm, that's a very practical problem solved um, from that experimentation and that journey. But how many months of painstaking research went into finding that solution? I mean, it was on and off. So the three months in New York doing the, the courses, that was like, that was all experimentation and then I would come back to it. So maybe five months in total. Wow. Yeah. Um, a lot of your work is still created by hand and in the past you've likened your drawings to journaling. Does it still feel that cathartic for you? Even more so, mm -hmm. um, because now with the artist algorithm, I'm looking at the idea of the admin end of an exhibition as well, thinking about funding, sponsorship, um, just like everything, all this sort of documentation, recording, mm -hmm. uh, being in charge of that, and even on the sales end of the exhibition, like looking at the entire value chain, and I'm, I have, I mean, effectively full control and responsibility for that, um, which has been a different learning curve. And so even more so, painting is cathartic. Like it's fun, it's fun, yeah. This is the fun part. It's fun. Um, I want you to uh, sort of delve into that idea of you taking on a lion's share of the responsibility for this exhibit because historically um, you've worked within the gallery system. On this exhibition you are working outside of the gallery system. Um, and in addition to being the creative, you have put on several hats, including the businesswoman hat. Why decide at this point in your career to take on um, so much responsibility? Yeah, I mean, it was an experiment. <laughs> it was an experiment in the same way that being an artist was an experiment and then it became a thing. Um, so it was just a thought, like what would it be like if you know I controlled everything? Um, every single facet. Yeah, every single facet, but I have to say, I feel like I, I, in this transition, I feel like a, and I don't want to say I was a baby artist before, but I feel like an adult artist having taken the responsibility. I also have more, I think, empathy for the galleries that I've worked with before mm -hmm. and um, really what their contributions are. I think sometimes you have, and I have Ibrahim Mahama here. I dying to oh, hear wow. your questions at the end. Uh, fellow artist, colleague, Legend. Uh, legend. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Legend. <laughs> artist extraordinaire from Accra. And so I'm sure he could speak to some of these um, ideas as well about ownership and uh, just having the impact that you want to have in a given space. Um, so, yeah, I have more empathy for the galleries now. A lot of artists sometimes complain that artists, um, galleries take 50 percent, right? Galleries take 50. If you have a good exhibition and the gallery has paid for everything, Sometimes they deserve more than 50%, right? Like mm. that is just a fact, right? When you have the spreadsheets and you tabulate everything, if you have an exhibition of this caliber, the gallery actually deserves more than that. But in many cases they don't, right? So it's just a matter of the artist understanding, um, not just saying it's not fair, mm -hmm. right? Like where are the numbers? Have you calculated, have you tabulated what the share should be? And that's a real exercise I had to learn I mean, with all my mathematical knowledge, I had to still sit down and learn that and like think about the bookkeeping, budgeting. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I have a much better understanding of, of the entire ecosystem now, I think. Did you enjoy being that in the weeds? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think your eyebrows said it all. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. I'm still reflecting on it. Okay. I'm still reflecting on it. Yeah. What What are your initial feelings about being that involved and wearing that many hats and juggling that those all those balls? Yeah. So I think my initial feelings are that you know the art is one thing, or my art career is one thing, but I think this journey has done more for me personally. Right. When I say like I'm a big artist or a big girl now, like <laughs> that level of responsibility or adulting, right? Is that what we call it? Adulting. <laughs> yes. Adulting feels very much like. I don't know, I, I have a, I've stepped into a different type of power for myself, mm -hmm. not even just as an artist. So, yeah. Um, can we talk about swimming? It remains central to your work. Uh, what about the swimming theme continues to compel you? I could, I could, I could, I could use the metaphor of swimming for, for forever, really. It feels quite, there are infinite possibilities when you're talking about different spaces of water, whether it's a swimming pool or a river or a sea and how universal water is to us and how we move through spaces um, and how we are how we align ourselves to other people within 
within spaces and continue to do so. Um, so many metaphors. I mean, for me personally, like swimming is a, is a meditative exercise, much like journaling is. You have to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. When you meditate, they have you breathe in and breathe out, and that's effectively what swimming is. Um, so it's like, while you're alive, just you gotta just keep breathing. Um, I know that you um, wrote in an artist statement recently that um, so many swim stories, especially when they're associated with black people, often have a tragic narrative associated with them. But your work attempts to at least present a counter narrative to that. Can you delve into that more and how swimming black people in tragedy don't go hand in hand yeah. always? No, I they, think it's important. They don't go hand in hand always. Um, unfortunately, and I can say this within this context, um, but uh, this context meaning all of us are you know, sort of in Africa and we mm -hmm. have more sort of African stories. Um, but ever since I started painting swimmers, if I meet somebody like in Uber, at a hotel, at an event, and people say, what do you do? Oh, I paint swimmers. Everyone volunteers their swim story to me. <laughs> They're like, oh, I had this uncle, or when I was younger, like everyone just straight up, like straight away. Um, but I did find, unfortunately, that when black people would tell me a story, they'd say I had somebody pass away, you know, something, it was always tragic, right? Mm. So statistically, Statistically, the stories are often tragic. Um, but I think with my work, I'm trying not to focus on that, right? I, I want it to be more uplifting. I want to show examples of representation and amplify stories where the stories haven't been tragic, right? I worked with a group of synchronized swimmers in Harlem, all black geriatric swim team. So the youngest member was 65 <laughs> and the oldest member is now 99, God willing, 100 in February. And, and she's featured in the work she's in this in the room. Work up there, yeah. And they're just killing it, just killing it in Harlem. They're like the darlings of, of, of that city. And they give back to the community by teaching young kids how to swim. And so that's a really triumphant story of black people swimming. And with the last exhibition, I did a documentary on them. It was aired on PBS this summer and, you know, sort of amplifying that and that it's never too late to learn. Many of these swimmers learned to learn when they were, learned to swim, excuse me, when they were in their sixties and seventies. Um, so there's still hope for me because I hope. can't swim. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, there's hope. You'll teach me? I can teach you. <laughs> <laughs> breathe teach in, you. breathe out. Breathe in, um, I know that um, the, the woman that is featured in this work, uh, can you talk to me about the relationship that developed between you all during this yeah, process? Because yeah. I love the stories about her. Yeah. So Miss Latisse is the 99-year-old swimmer from the Harlem Honeys and Bears that I just talked about. And you said 99. She's 99, yeah. So when I met her, she was 96, and she had just gotten married like three months prior. <laughs> to, I think for the second or third time. Um, and she's youthful. She's like beautiful. She always talks about how, you know, the young man, She, I think he's like 30 years, her junior or something, keeps her on her toes and how she eats so well and she doesn't eat trash and how her food isn't delicious, but her body's delicious. So... <laughs> It's just really funny. And she's also a pageant queen. So again, <laughs> she's doing all of these really interesting things later on in life that she just did not have access to, even if she had dreamt of it when she was younger. Um, so yeah, I went to her house a few times. We had some issues um, filming at the public swimming pool that they were at, you know, just American regulations with parks and recs. They didn't want us having cameras there all the time. So I had to go to her house quite often. And just like, I would photograph her sitting on something and then just pretend that it was like a swimming pool. And then I would paint her in the swimming pool when I got home. Um, but in that time, we ended up watching like the Miss America pageant in 2018. And like, I think the top five finalists that year, three of them were black women. This is a big deal, right? This is like a big deal. And she just kept going on about it because she's diligently been watching these pageants for like decades now. Um, so she was like, so many, so many chocolate girls, so many chocolate girls in the, in the, in the final five. And then, it, you know, it was like a, a dark skinned uh, black woman from New York who ended up winning that year. I was like, look at all this, you know, melanin, yeah. melanin magic yeah. going and on. And then thereafter, I think like Miss Universe, wasn't there like a whole thing mm -hmm. where like yeah. all the competitions, Miss Universe, Miss World, yeah. Miss America, everyone was won by like the chocolate girls. So, yeah. 
Yay, chocolate yay, girls. Yay, chocolate girls. <laughs> um, uh, you, you mentioned that she was 99, so she's essentially uh, almost a century on this earth. Uh, it's To me, it's interesting that you can trace the history of America through one of its rela- one of its relationships is with swimming. That's right. Um, we, we know about segregated water fountains, but there were segregated pools as well. A, a number of black people in America can't swim for that very reason. Um, so can you speak to me about the historical significance of not only knowing a woman who's been on this earth for nearly 100 years, but tracing her relationship with swimming sure. and the history of America? I can definitely speak to that. And I think, um, as I said, this is this Why Nations Win is an introduction to the traveling body of work, but that question remains central to all of the works. And so when we're looking at 100 years of American swimming history through this 100-year-old woman, it's still answering the question, why do nations win? Because they can choose somebody who ordinarily wouldn't be the narrator of a century, of a, of a country, right? Of a story, of a country's story, and have her talk about that country through her lens, right? And so that's what I'm doing with my art. and. Um, I've also used some literature. So Jeff Wiltz is a, is a, is a social historian who writes about um, the last 100 years of swimming history in the US. He looks at the privatization of communal swimming pools and how that degraded community life and how that led to sort of further segregation. Um, and so I'm going to imagine a fictional version of Miss Latisse, maybe when she was, I don't know, 20 something years old, not even able to get into a swimming pool area because she wouldn't be allowed to, right? So she might be fenced off. Um, and then 60-year-old Miss Latisse learning to swim for the first time. Um, it's, it's a big project. So that's one thing I have been working on for the last three years and was able to ex- expand on that with my research fellowship at the Smithsonian to get more sort of visual references. What did the swimming pool look like in the 1950s so that it's also visually accurate as I place this fictional version of Miss Latisse from birth to 100 years old. Yeah, to track that. Let's shift gears and speak about these exquisite medallions. Um, They're a new and welcomed addition to your body of work. Speak to us about their significance and their genesis. Uh, So the number, (laughs) there are a number of answers to this question, but I'll go with uh, uh, like what really sort of uh, viscerally inspired it. So the last exhibition, which I'm always, I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of the way that we all sort of interacted and worked with one another and how the exhibition then subsequently traveled. And that was led by the gallery director, Marwan Zakem, who just did such a great job with just handling all of the, the, the facets of the exhibition. And so I wanted to- And that was gallery 1957. Gallery 1957, yeah, um, Marwan Zakem. So I wanted to give him sort of like a gift or a trophy, a swimming trophy. So I started Googling swimming trophies and they're all really awfully designed, right? Like, they're just not cute. And so I was like, let me design my own trophy and then see if I can have it made. So I went from trophies to medallions and then this happened. Um, <laughs> I mean, so, this, you know, happened. this happened. Yeah, it happened. Uh, but yeah, and then I have like the local context by putting Ashoke lanyards that we bought um, en masse in, in Ibadan. And if you look at the figures, they're, they're swimming together, they're working together. Um, and this exhibition as well, I had thought about it being hosted around the time of the Olympics, right? The 2020, what would have been the 2020 Olympics and then 2021. But thinking about why, why is there s- such little representation at the Olympics? I mean, the answer is just always, it's always the same. Like, why do nations win? It's the same question. of, It's the same answer. Um, as to why there's such little representation of African countries within the Olympics, for example, right? And so I was just thinking about this Olympic imagery, medals, celebrating what we already do have. Um, And we're winning in many ways. I think definitely we're winning on the creative front. Um, So that speaks to that. that. Um, One of the most compelling artistic signatures is the torch portions of your work. Can you speak about the role? Can you speak about the role that fire plays in your work and how it's informed by your childhood spent growing up in post-genocide Rwanda? Yes, so when I, when we first moved to Rwanda, I was about 11 years old 
uh, we had moved from the States to Rwanda and we were to go to school there. But in visiting a number of schools, you could still see the aftermath of, of the war. Like even in the airport, for example, you might have a tall, a tall glass wall like this and you just see bullets all over like at the top. There was no visible violence at the time, but the remnants of violence just had not been cleaned up. And um, you had really beautiful, colorful buildings, but all these bullet holes in them. For some reason, it just stuck in my head as actually an alluring image. Um, I don't know, it just stuck and it made its way into my visual vocabulary. But it's also inspiring for me to see that in my short lifetime, I'm 36 now, I was 11 then, uh, the, the story of Rwanda has changed completely. And it's an example that, you know, the transformation, swift transformation, although from a tragic uh, start, is possible. So it reminds me of what's possible for Nigeria as well. And can you uh, speak about actually how the the burnt pieces come to be? Oh. Or is that giving away too much of the secret sauce? Okay. No, I have all of this on video. So I have torches of different sizes of, you know, they do different things. If I splash water on the canvas before torching it, it gives like a freckled effect. I can sort of trace and draw with it. Um, sometimes it's matches if I want to use something really small. Uh, sometimes you use the, like a gas burner mm -hmm. if I want like a circular patch. <laughs> I just use what I can get, so, yeah. Have you always been drawn to fire? <laughs> Are you trying to say something? No, no, I'm not. I mean, your mom is in the front row, so I can ask her. <laughs> mom? mom? Have I always been drawn to fire? No, right? No. no. Okay. It'd be ice cream, not fire. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we talk about uh, the fellowship that you received from the Smithsonian? Yeah. So we spoke during that period and you told me the wildest story about how you got locked in the museum overnight and you said it so casually, but I know that experience also played a major role in shaping this exhibition. Yeah. One, how did you get stuck in the museum overnight and what exactly happened in that museum? I know. How does one get stuck in the museum overnight? Um, I was just being, I think I was just being a bit careless. I, um, yeah. To be honest, I don't know how it led up to it, but the, my phone was dead <laughs> and the security had locked. So I had, a, I had an office space like in the back and I took the front to get out something like I just missed my way and um, they had locked up the museum. And I thought, you know what? The security patrols like every hour on the hour. So I'm just going to wait it out and someone's going to come and find me. From 6 p.m. to 4 a.m. I was in that museum by myself. My phone was dead. My, my watch had stopped working. And I was like, maybe God is just trying to tell me to sit down mm -hmm. and like be still and work with what I have. Cause I was also just applying for different fellowships. It's like, you're already at a fellowship, just calm down, right? Like, so I had all this sketchbook stuff in my bag and I poured it all out and started rearranging it. Let me tell you when the security guy found me, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it was like the funniest thing ever. But uh, I was sitting down cross-legged with all of this stuff rearranged around me. I looked like a babalao. <laughs> and the guy was so scared. He was like, <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> so he was like, and he knew I wasn't like homeless. I was probably like made up. He's like, what am I looking at? It's 4 a.m. <laughs> and then. He probably thought you were an apparition. Seriously. Yes. I mean, I thought I was, right? So, um, so I was just sitting there, but I had like all these epiphanies. I was like, and then he picked up my passport and it had a black like African cover. And I was like, imagine if all of Africa had the same currency. And he was getting so inspired by everything that I was saying. He didn't know. So Wait, so you were speaking to the guard. <laughs> Security guard. This is at 4 a.m. Okay. Now. So he was taking notes. Like, this is so inspiring because he's from Ivory Coast. He's taking mm. notes. But at the same time, like, I have to report this to security. So he'd be like, 10-4, <laughs> Like, we have a... <laughs> and then would, like, go back to having this inspiring conversation <laughs> with me about Africa and the future of Africa and what it could be. And like, I mean, I had, I had, I had a, a few epiphanies, right? Even just about the beginning of time, what the end of time would look like. I think Kobe Bryant and um, his daughter yeah, just had just passed. passed. And I was just thinking through the idea of like, the fact that nobody actually owns anything, mm. right? Like even your children, you don't, you, don't, you don't own them, right? And just this idea of like being able to give up everything to have something. And when you think you have everything, you should just know you don't have anything. And just thinking about 
polarities and and what what causes people to act and i reduced it to like love and fear that if you can choose or make decisions just based out of love if we could all do that then yeah we'd be in a better place mm -hmm. yeah that's powerful yeah yeah um, just a few more questions, and then I will open it up to the audience. But uh, during your I hope you guys still with us? Oh, they're here. <laughs> you, uh, yeah. Oh, we got, we got some snaps. snaps. They're definitely okay. here. Okay. okay. During your time away, you also embarked on a deep spiritual journey. You've been open about going to therapy. Can you talk to me about why you decided at that point in your life that you were ready to dig deep, to excavate, if you will, to arrive at the place you are today? Yeah. I don't think I actually decided myself. I was having a few conversations with my my younger brother who was here during the week. Um, and he's also a new creative. He's just written an incredible book and is having massive success, success with it. That's already been optioned by Netflix and Daniel Kaluuya is going to play the, the main character in the film. We dropping these names, watch your toes. <laughs> <laughs> I've already told your mom she needs to write a book. I'm just trying to get her to to, to agree. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Lola. <laughs> I'm here for you, girl. Uh, yeah. Okay, so yes. So I spoke to him. You spoke to him. <laughs> yeah. I spoke to him and um I don't know, just he was like, You you don't sound like okay. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, you probably want to see someone. And so he gave me somebody's number and we started doing like Zoom therapy sessions. Um yeah, weekly. We did that for like all of, I actually had two therapists. And I also have to say, Misan Rawane is here. She actually started this whole journey with me of what I wanted the next exhibition and what my career would look like. Misan and I were, I was at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She was at the business school eight years ago, nine years ago. And we've remained friends since. And she's been there like throughout the entire career when I first started the game. But when I said I wanted to do something different, I was like, let me talk to my consultant friend. So she sat down and asked me all of these questions. What do you want to do? What kind of revenue? Blah, 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 like all these questions. And we started doing that weekly, just strategy sessions on everything. So I had to think really strategically about what I wanted. But it all boiled down to like what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so that therapy was important for me to even touch before I even was able to touch the strategy stuff, right? And it helps you to understand that you can do really anything if you're like, okay, but you need to be okay first. Um, so a combination of, of my son, my, my brother, the two different therapists I was seeing, I have another sort of like youth pastor I was talking to, um, just sort of getting back to the central core, like what's important in life, yeah. And did that um, sort of the digging deep, the excavation, the therapy, how did that find its way into your work? Um, it, it helped me to let go. It helped me to, first of all, do this at this time and understand that, you know, it's all just part of the process. You know, a lot of things, um, yeah, just, just realizing that it's like nothing is really that deep, I think, um, like in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, again, just a few more questions and then I promise you'll be able to ask some as well. Um, I want to pull back out and talk about 2020. It really seemed to be the year that the world discovered black portraiture and specifically African portraiture. Um, I'm curious what you think about this significant uptick in interest. Um, I think, so a rising tide will yeah. float all boats. Um, so that's a great thing. So when Black Lives Mattered last year, uh, I say that a bit tongue in cheek. Yeah, the, uh, I, I, I caught the shit. <laughs> I caught the shade. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you when know, Black Lives Matter last, last year, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> people were more interested in that type of portraiture, and I think I think it's a great thing. I think it it produced so many opportunities for young artists who otherwise weren't doing much, right, or didn't realize that there was a platform for their work. And I'm when I think about this game and underemployment and unemployment, the creative sector. Um, really presents an opportunity for young people to get in there and see what they can do with their hands and they find their audience using social media. I think it's a beautiful thing instead of, I mean, just doing other things that, that don't contribute, like that don't benefit us, right? right. Um, so I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, and then representation, we're seeing black bodies everywhere. Sometimes I'm like, oh, it's a bit cliche, but I think by and large, it's, 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 a, it's a positive thing. And 
that representation just lets people know that they can participate in art worlds in in multiple and creative ways. Yeah. So next stop on the tour, Senegal. Senegal. <laughs> uh, yeah, next stop on the tour is Senegal. Like I said, this exhibition was was supposed to be for Senegal, so I have to <laughs> go back to the drawing board and figure out what Senegal exhibition is going to look like. I have a strong feeling it's going to be pink themed. So get your pink outfits. <laughs> We're going to Senegal. Um, no, so just uh, inspired by the pink lake in Senegal. There's a beautiful pink lake, it's like mysterious, and there'll be works to show and and celebrate that. Right. Let's keep everything on the continent. We don't have to go all the way to New York before you see a world class exhibition. So Senegal is next, and it's pink. Right. And last question from me. Are you here to stay this time or will you be disappearing yet again? I think I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I have a great supportive team. Um, we have some momentum. We have, we just have work to do. Like we've been in experimentation mode. We have bills to pay, <laughs> you know? And so we're, we're, yeah, we're here, we're here. We have people to inspire. We're gonna be traveling. I have the energy. So at least for the next year, I will roll out the artist algorithm uh, the way it was envisioned. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, audience, you ready? Questions, questions, questions. I'm ready, ready, ready. You know you have yeah. questions. Come on. Yo, yes. Who has a mic? Who has a mic? Hi, everyone. Um, question for you is, I remember your Dear Young Artist exhibition many years ago. Okay. Not so many years ago um, in Lagos. Um, how has your art advice for young artists evolved based on your last year and a half of deep work and disconnecting? Uh, so she's talking about a, uh, Misan is talking about a, a poem that I wrote a few years ago and then I turned it into a song with M.I., the Nigerian rapper. And it's effectively, it's effectively a letter to young artists advising them that these waters are turbulent. It's like there are no real set rules or no agreed upon objectives within the art world. And so you have to understand what that is internally first before jumping in. And then you have to learn how to swim. You have to find a community of synchronized swimmers, like-minded um, partners and collaborators uh, to effectively do good work. Uh, and I talk about pacing yourself. I actually say like, don't get tired, right? A lot of people drown because Sometimes they're good swimmers, but they just get tired. Um, and so I took that advice personally and took time out so that I wouldn't overwhelm myself in that time. So I've done it now, right? Before it was just a letter, it was just in theory, but I can say that um, that, that was good advice. Yeah, to take your time, to take your time. Hello, Motufe. Um great presentation. So I guess the question is why, why do nations win? Right, I mean, there are a lot of themes in your in your work about synchronization. I see education theme as well. Um, how is that going to pull together, and maybe what sort of social action will come out of it? What do you hope to come out of it? Mm. Why do nations win? <laughs> I mean, you can approach that question from so many yeah. different vantage points. Yeah. I mean, from the policy point, from the artistic point, just the emotional and spiritual rootedness of a country. That we, how does how does one answer a question like that? So many things. I mean, so I mean, the reason why I had that question there, and I've thought about this answer a lot, and just to, I always want to push the answer or the question back to whoever has asked the question, <laughs> because nations are made out of individuals, right? And so our aggregate actions are what make us a Nigeria. And so I think a better question to ask is, how do you win? Like, how do you lead yourself? Um, how do you demonstrate leadership? within your own community. You might run a small business and there are just four of you, but how do you lead there, right? Um, and so that's leadership. But I think ideas are just celebrating what works, right? Celebrating what is good so you have more to celebrate. Documenting things, being able to go back and revise. Um, uh, consulting with people that know better, right? Like find, pick a worthy rival. Nigeria could pick another country and say, those guys are doing this like well, right? And, and compete in a healthy way. Um, and I think, I, I haven't mentioned him yet, but Simon Sinek is an author that, I mean, his, his thesis is like my thesis. I copy everything he's, he like does and says, but he has a really great text 
about this idea of like of an infinite game versus like a finite game and how you can be an, a, a infinite thinking person, right? So nations win, not because there's a war and people uh, win or lose, but they play in such a way that they perpetuate the game for everyone, right? Like how do you play in that way? And the answer is love. <laughs> the answer is love. Um, I have uh, one more question and then I'll circle back. But um, in the past, you've said that some of your artistic practice is focused on quote, patriotic worrying about Nigeria. And I immediately thought of the weathered flag that rests above us all. Um, how does patriotic worrying about Nigeria drive your work? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm a bit of an observer. I, you know, sometimes I, I spend quite a lot of time on my own and I sit back and, and watch what's going on. And I'm like, does nobody else see this? Like, what's going on? Like, we should be worried, right? Like, there's fire on the mountain, right? And nobody seems to be on the run. Um, yeah, so I'm worried about it, and I'm trying to express the urgency of, of, of the situation. It's actually a bit of a miracle that we're all still kind of intact. Um, so that inspires the work. That inspires the work. OK. Um, I think the. Ibrahim Mahama had a question. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Came all the way from Hello. Accra. Hi. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. very much. Um, I think it's such a beautiful exhibition. Um, even like the choice of space in terms of the architecture. Shapes and forms. Uh, I've always been very much interested in your technique as an artist in terms of what you go through. Like take the materials through in order to produce the image. Yeah. So... I'm just basically thinking about your practice in the long term in terms of maybe site specificity and also the social conditions which are represented within your work or which your work embodies. Like uh, going forward in terms of, choice of choices of space, like how is that going to be thought about in relation to the forms that your work come along with? Because remember in 1957, you created this pool, which was really beautiful. Yeah, so I also imagine that maybe in Lagos, because, you know, <laughs> Nigeria, as in Ghana, there's a lot of decay and your work. There's so much decay also within your work. So I'm very much interested in how your work also fits within, let's say, spaces that ordinarily we wouldn't think of when yeah. we're thinking about artistic uh, productions. No, for sure. And I think we're sitting in an example of, of, of that sort of space point and thinking through why nations win and having all of these sort of game theory analogies. And this space, Alara, um, designed by architect David Ajay, is a very playful uh, space. And I love the fact that there's so many stairs. It reminds me of the idea of like a progression or ascension or, or process or levels, right? Like the, the three year journey, it's like, okay, you started from somewhere and then you get to a, a place and you're ascending. You go back, you revisit, you come back up, but always with this infinite mindset of, of playing the game. Um, Ghana. Yeah, next. I know Ibrahim <laughs> Mahama has, and I mean, I don't, I don't even know what word in my vocabulary could describe the space that he has. Um, Savannah Contemporary, uh, S C C A, <laughs> uh, Art Center, and it's in Tamale, like in the northern part of 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 Ghana. How many hectares? Can you can you talk about it a little bit? No, please, no. please, please. No. Okay. Okay. Fine. But it's <laughs> but it's incredible, and it's a beautiful space. He has spent his time, his energy, just dedicated to building a space where artists can come and exhibit, children can come and learn, play. They're like airplanes that he's decommissioned and they, they, they sit there, they get to imagine, they get to innovate. So, gonna stop is with you, E.B. <laughs> um, you yeah. heard it here Yeah, first. we heard it here because you're thinking of spaces. You've, ar you've already dreamt up the space for me. I just need to bring up my work. But, um, this is a great an example of, you know, an exhibition that I, I dreamt of actually in Lagos years ago, but the space hadn't existed yet. So Lara, Mrs. Uh, Falawio has her own vision and it's, it's come together, right? And in such a beautiful way. Yeah. Absolutely, it's come together magically. Okay, more questions. Azu. Azu, the uh, great Azu, the legendary Azu. Uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Founder, founder <laughs> of Lagos Photo Film Festival. Yes, your question, con sir. Congratulations, uh, Madhubeer. This is a great exhibition. Um, 
from your very first uh, presentation, you always had the dice, and the die um, as a kind of a symbol for chance. And um, we currently share an exhibition that really focuses a bit on the hope, lottery. Um, so my, I guess my question is, how has that changed in your perception over the years, the role of chance, the role of uh, uh, synchronicity, or the role of um, unintended consequences in creating, or in um, perhaps as a sort of a guidance to younger artists coming up, you know, say, well, chance or intention or deliberation, that sort of thing. I think because there's a lot of emphasis on hope, prayer, you know, and I'm not trying to provide a solution, but I think it's important to sort of, uh, you know, have a position in that regard. No, that's fair. I think um, I've always thought about chance in in the sense that I know that being born at a certain time into a certain family in a certain place puts me at an advantage, right? Like the game up there, if you are if you are born in the wrong place or wrong family, you, you, you actually cannot win that game, right? You just have to stay in it and, and almost sort of cheat your way out, right? And so I think about chance in that way that I have a, a fortunate starting point. But to your point about uh, just being deliberate and consistent uh, and strategic, right? Um, I would definitely maybe advise my younger artist self or other artists to, to ask questions, right? If you don't know everything. You can, you can talk to people who know more than, than you do. Um, I've applied for some fellowships for four years in a row, been rejected from, from each one, and they don't even tell you why. You, you, you submit like a 25 page proposal and they just say, sorry, you know, no feedback or anything. And so the idea of also just being resilient um, and, and, and knowing what you want and just improving. Each time I submit a proposal, it's, it's, it's improved upon. And at the end of the day, I'm able to use those same proposals for an exhibition like this. Um, so yeah, just I think being more intentional. Am I answering your question, Azu? Okay, yeah. To, to any artist that might be in here, just thinking through intentionality and um, consistency. Your approach when you create your works. So you studied education, and I think of arts in some ways as similar to music, mm -hmm. where you can either be just telling a story of what it is, mm -hmm. or you can be trying to educate people on something, mm -hmm. or maybe what could be. So how do you think about the balance between teaching or educating versus just storytelling? and narrating mm. your works. Hmm. I, I think the balance is definitely tipped in the education, sort of teaching didactic modes of like activating my artwork. I don't think I wanna tell a story just to tell a story. Um, I think particularly in speaking to younger people or just my, my fundamental belief in the power of education, I like I push it, I go there. Sometimes it seems like a lot, it seems, um, like, why can't it just be art for art's sake? But my real mission with my art is to teach and to learn and to have people ask more questions. This question of why is one that particularly in Nigerian education systems I've seen, you know, you're not encouraged to ask the question why. If you ask why, someone will say, well, just because, that's what, because I said so, right? Um, and so this question of why and continuing to ask why until you can synthesize um, that process down to something that makes sense, right? Um, yeah, I, I want the work to provoke that kind of reaction. Yeah. I think there's a question in the corner here. Um, I want to just echo an amazing uh, work so far. Um, the question I have for you is what drove you to take a chance on yourself, right? You had a, a chemical engineering background, you studied, you had a master's, and you went to school again. What drove you to kind of put all of those, uh, uh, that track on hold to take a chance on yourself in something that we don't see uh, a lot of success or big success stories that, you know, you might see a few people, but what gave you that uh, drive to say, I'm going to take a chance. And then what advice do you have for the many other talented, you know, artists uh, that maybe don't have the same kind of access that you've had in terms of friends or just even education? What advice do you have for them to, to help them kind of get up their, their ladders? 
I think you, you have to talk about how this was just meant to be a year long experiment, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I decided to become a full time artist in, well, for a year in 2014 um, during my, like, the end of my NYSE year. And I think I was 28, 29 at the time. I thought, this is probably the last time I can make a really irresponsible decision <laughs> before people start saying, are you not too old for these type of, you know, <laughs> these types of switches? So I thought, I'll do this for a year and I'll see how it goes. Then I'll go and like find something serious. But even when I finished my chemical engineering degree, the idea of getting a job at Mobile Shell, I was just like, why would I do that? I just, I never ever not once thought about that as like a viable track for me. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think, again, back to Simon Sinek, he talks about the fact that courage is actually external. I don't think I had a lot of people saying, yeah, 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 do it. But I had people around me that I knew that like, if I fell, I would, I would be caught, right? Um, and I knew that if I had questions, I could ask. And I knew that if I needed to borrow some funds, there's Mama Bank, there's Papa Bank. <laughs> But they do, and this is one thing I really love and admire about my parents, like they've helped me out with sort of even renting a space from them, but they make me pay them back with interest, right? Because they say, if you're gonna have a viable, sorry to call you out mom, but <laughs> if you're gonna have a viable business, you need to know what your numbers are and we can't just be giving you something for free. You've gone to all these great schools. If you can't figure this out, who do you expect to figure it out? So I appreciate that sort of uh, uh, solid support. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and just that understanding that, that I would figure it out, right? Like I have that, that um, permission from them to do it and that, I, and that I would figure it out. So I would advise other people. I don't know, this is always tough for me because I just recognize how fortunate I am. I'm not somebody that goes around saying, yeah, 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 jump. No, 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 like you might not make it. <laughs> that's just the truth. <laughs> that's, just the, that's just the honest truth. And so I try to give, uh, that advice on like a case by case basis. I would have to know more to understand where that person is starting from and um, push them forward. But if, if there's anything I could say, just education. If that person is willing and open to learning and committed to the process of learning, they'll get somewhere, right? They'll get somewhere. And that learning process, there's failure involved, there's revision, there's you know, working in groups, working in teams. Um, if that person understands that idea, they they'll be fine, but a lot of people don't, and so they might not be fine. So I don't sort of, the artist algorithm was this idea that like, artists are gonna take over the world, let's all start doing our own exhibitions. It's not easy, you know, and it might not be fun. So yeah, I, I would take it on a case by case basis and just keep it very real. Okay, just a few more questions and then I think we'll be winding down for the morning, so. Uh, hi, Modupe. Um, it's the artist algorithm, and I, I imagine you've had more than artists, you know, explore your work. I know you had students come around yesterday and the day before yesterday. So do you have any expecta expectations around what you want people to take out of this experience when they engage with it? And if you do, do you want to shed some light on it? Yeah, sure. I mean, I had students come, not yesterday, but the day before, and I have to say that was one of my favorite days. Um, again, because they're students and they're very much in the mode of learning and taking something away from the exhibition, they had so many questions and insights and you know, they were asking for advice. Somebody asked for a mentoring opportunity, a shadowing opportunity, um, and they're really concerned. It's something I find about the, the younger sort of student generation now. They are concerned about things like climate change, about you know what sort of world they're leaving for the next generation. And I, I credit that generation for that trait because some people think they're distracted, they're always on social media, but they were actually really invested in some of the challenges that were being described in the people's algorithm education game. Like, what do we do? What do you think we should do? Like, I have this idea for a startup and you know that's, that's where it starts sometimes, just um, something to ignite the fact that you're looking at statistics and you're saying, there are 12 million uh, young children that are out of school. That's an addressable market, right? So it's not, it's not even just a charity thing. We need to help these kids. You can come up with a business to, to solve that problem. And I love that as students who are thinking about what they're going to do and how they're going to contribute to society, they're already thinking through that from the game, from playing the game. Yeah. 
Jackie, 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 Jackie. Can you move this there? Um, so congratulations once again. Thank um, you. I just want to find out what has been the most challenging moments since you decided to become an artist and how did you navigate through it? And secondly, what has been the most amazing moment for you since you became an artist? This morning with us. So that's <laughs> easy. Short that's answer. Easy. Um, um, so the most amazing moments always come after the most difficult moments I've found. Um, I, and there's so many, but I'll just zero in on one. Uh, when I did the Dakar Biennale in 2016 um, with this same game, uh, as we wrote a great text for it, uh, Che Ajibola from Zerkin Marine, they sponsored us to go to Senegal. Um, and I was representing Nigeria. Everything, I mean, I started doing project management then, so that was my first real sort of shot at, at, at taking project management seriously. Actually, because prior to that, I had a disastrous event <laughs> somewhere else, and I told myself I would never, ever allow that to happen again. Um, and so I took the project management of that trip going to Dakar really, really seriously. But everything that you could imagine could go wrong went wrong, right? This, this game that I spent three, three months of my life building, they, they, it got stuck in Paris, right? And it was supposed to go to Senegal. And so instead of being upset about it, I said, well, I have sponsorship money. I assembled a group of like 20 students and in five days we created the game again. And we had an exhibition offsite in a space that nobody had ever been to, but it's like the most beautiful space in Dakar. It's like a big lighthouse. Um, and then I won the prize. I didn't even realize that there were prizes to be won at this exhibition. The president was on stage and they were calling my name to come and pick up this prize. I wasn't even there because I didn't know that there were prizes to be awarded, right? But then I got this prize. Everyone comes, you won the prize. I was like, what prize? What prize? Where were you? The president was waiting for you. But um, so obviously there's glory in that, but it was, it was really, really, really tough. I was like, this is so unfair. Why did they leave my game? Like out of all people. And then I had like all of these expenses and then, you know, but then it worked, right? And everyone was like, you're fine. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a great example of also me taking charge. And that was tested, right? I had done all this project management. But can I project management? How can you project management without the necessary risks, right? And so it was almost like a test that I was able to sort of um, pass. Did I answer? Yeah, great, greatest, yeah. And then it's always good interacting with people. I think my greatest moments are like artist talks, questions, getting to see that people are connecting with the work. People might leave with some nuggets of, I don't know, wisdom or inspiration. So that's always helpful. Jackie was with me when I first started my career in 2014. We both did the national art competition and we were both the top 12 finalists. She just had an incredible show in Abuja, traveled to Lagos. She's killing it in the streets. Um, and Azu was also the director, well still is the director of the artist African, African Artist Foundation that effectively launched my career when I did the national art competition in 2014 and won the Ella Natui Prize. And they've just been supporting with my day one homies, day one art homies, thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay. Um, Shay, questions? We have, yeah. to take the, we have to take a question from our, our sponsor so we won't get cut off next time. <laughs> so, congratulations, of course, uh, in order. I just wanted to find out what's next for the Rubik's Crew, the people who are going What are you going to, yeah. What's, what's the future of that? Yeah, Thank people you. always get really excited about the Rubik's Cube and, and what it can be. And even at some point after Dakar, I started taking classes on game design. I was taking all these like Stanford online classes on how to design a game and like make it into an app. And I was like, just stop. Like, this is, no, just go back and paint. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, th there's potential there. I don't know if it's for me, at least not now. Um, the students asked the same question. They said, you can work with the World Bank. You can bring this to a beach and have more people interact with it in the just in, in a public space. So it's um, maybe not as intimidating as being in an art space because art spaces are still pretty intimidating um, in terms of how people feel they can access and just play around and, and talk. Um, yeah, I've, I've shared this presentation a few times with the World Bank over the years, and they love it. And they always ask the same question: like, what's next? What can we do with this? The short answer is, I I don't know. I did try to to design games better, but I think it's a good time to maybe hand it off to people who could do that better, right?
right? They're better equipped to figure out the game because as the game stands, it actually doesn't satisfy like the five requirements of effective game design. Probably satisfies like two, two and a half, maybe. So I would need the game design experts to step in um, on what I've already sort of conceptually uh, started. Let me know if you have any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> any final questions? Uh -huh. Any questions, girl? <laughs> Thank you. Well boo. done. <laughs> Two thumbs up from mom. That's fantastic. Thank you, mama. Um, any final thoughts before we let these lovely people enjoy the rest of their day? Um, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm really grateful that everyone has come. The, fil the seats are filled. Um, I was really looking forward to just being calm and excited and ready to receive you all for the artist talk. It's always my favorite portion of any show or exhibition. Um, yeah, everyone stay inspired, stay safe, stay in the spirit of love. And um, yeah, thanks for all the support. Appreciate, appreciate, appreciate. And thank you, Mommy. I feel like you should say something, Mama. You want to say something? If you don't want to. I have several genius children. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, what do I have to say? I can say that I'm very proud that Mudukwe uh, has been consistent, you know, because I will, but I'll tell on you because you asked me to. <laughs> because as a kid, we just found this restlessness always restless but in school they find a way to make up into the stage so that she would be more you know like and when she decided she wanted to be an artist it was alarming because one day it was she, alarming it was alarming okay one day she called me when she was in uni she said you know i think i want to she said she wanted to be an architect and i said uh, architecture you can pull down a plan online you know, and then she said, okay, I'll do the engineer. And then she comes and say, one day she said, I want to be a doctor. Because I, our oldest sister was studying medicine. And so she said, oh, I said, I want to be a doctor. I said, I mean, everything, but let's keep medicine away. Because she said, why? I said, because you need to be more poised, more, you know, this. And, and I, and then she said, okay, I'll think about it. I said, but go and think about it. And so when she said she wanted to be an artist, it was alarming for me because she had a very good job and they cared about her and she she just decided so i said okay wait three more months three more months think about it three more months and she did then three more months and then she just didn't get back to us and so there were times when we would try to reach her in abuja nobody could reach her and one day i was actually getting ready to go to abuja to see where she was that she picked up the phone and then she had an exhibition at the fourth foundation I think. And it, what I found, she said, uh, she, all of seven days, she locked herself up and she painted a picture of how she was uh, feeling every day. And sometimes she was upside down, sometimes she was lying down, she was relaxed, and sometimes she looked like she was troubled. So when we got home, I just told the father, if it took seven depressing days, just like I did. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I'm happy that she's thriving because that's all you want your children to be. Yeah. So even in our position, it was more like, are you going to be able to cope? So I'm very happy and I hope that it's a lesson for the parents that all you can do is support your children, mm -hmm. make them accountable. Because all, that's all we did. We said, okay, if you don't want to work, you have a fantastic job. You work in a way. If you're going to follow my you will mm -hmm. So, and she has. So well done, Dupsy. We're very proud of you. <laughs> well done, Dupsy. We are very proud of you. Thank you all so much thank for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And have a wonderful thank day. You. Yeah, thank you. Woo! Yeah. Thanks. Oh, wait, wait. thanks to everyone. Final thank yous to the Alara team to my team at home, to all the sponsors, Erica Marine, Tangerine, Belvedere, everybody, Shirley, Samoa, Misan, literally like everybody in this room who supported. 
Jonas, I'm staying at the Nordic Hotel. Y'all killing it there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. God bless.